you know, I had such a weird childhood. I was training eight, 10 hours a day by the time I was 12 or 13. And these are the only people that really understand you. And yeah. I was not welcome anymore. But it's interesting because the more they resisted and the more they called me a liar, the more I knew that there was that I couldn't stop, that these yeah. children needed my protection and that they were hiding probably something worse than I could even imagine, which ended up being true. Jennifer Say, welcome to the American Glutton Podcast. Thank you for having me. It's nice to meet you. It's good to meet you too. So you were a gymnastic champion who became like a very hot shot business person. And now you're, now you're, you own a clothing brand. I, I want to hear how that happened. Like what, what was that arc like? I'm trying to jam as much into my life as possible. That's the main point I would make. Um, yeah, I was an elite gymnast as a child many, many millions of years ago. So, And I was on the national team for seven years, national champion in 1986. Um, it is a sport which most people know at this point that is rife with abuse, um, horrible emotional, physical, and sexual abuse. And um, I was actually the first former elite gymnast to speak out on that when I wrote my first book in 2008. And, you know, it's interesting because now you think, oh, everybody must have been open to hearing that. No, <laughs> not yeah, no, so. <laughs> I, I want to know about that because, um, and I, I, I don't know everybody's names, but I, I yeah. was, I was very aware recently, one of the head gymnasts for the national team got in big trouble for years and years and years of abuse. Right. And there was a court case and he's in jail, I believe. Well, so yeah, what happened, which is what kind of blew the doors wide open, is the doctor, the, I'm going to call him a doctor, his name is Larry Nasser, right. um, in 2016, one, two women came forward to say this doctor had sexually assaulted them during medical treatment when they were very young children. Um, and once those two people came forward, there were hundreds more within months. And so Larry Nasser is in prison for life. He was he was the doctor for 30 years for the national team. And he abused kids at national training camps, at international competitions with their parents in the room. He did it. It was like he would hold a blanket up. And these are children, right. you know, 10, 11, 12 years old. They don't know what's happening. And he's telling them it's medical treatment. And as it turns out, USA Gymnastics knew about it the whole time. Right. Uh, the Carolis, who were the national coaches, knew about it the whole time. So it was sort of the tip of the iceberg, right? Like he's not just this one bad apple. It is a sport that is rife with abuse. And yeah, I had come forward to speak out about that in my first book 10 years earlier. And everybody was like, she's a liar. She's a grifter. That didn't happen. These are great coaches. I mean, I wasn't talking about Nasser. I was talking about other coaches. Right. And 10, year, 10 years later, that story broke. And <laughs> Have I, any of the people come to apologize about the way that was reacted to at the time? No, you know what they actually do, which is not going to surprise you, is they pretend they supported you all along. Right. Even though there's recordings of them calling in on radio shows and there's, you know, screenshots. Although, you know, most of them have gone back and deleted, like they wrote these really nasty reviews calling me a horrible liar on Amazon. They've deleted all that. Yeah. Only one person has apologized. And it was very interesting because we are good friends now. Um she sort of threatened me with legal action for lying about our coaches, which I was not doing. And she called me several years later and she said, you were right about everything. I wasn't ready to accept it yet. You know, once you accept that you were abused, there's a long recovery. Right. It's difficult. And she apologized. And that's pretty remarkable. People don't do that. Well, I, I mean, also the way you laid it out, it's like you are questioning the whole structure of that industry that is an industry you know what i mean like right. women's gymnastics in nationals and olympics and stuff like that that's like the biggest weedy box selling part of it totally. like that's what we all tuned in for was that you know and then yeah. once in it's a while we get a michael phelps and we tune in specifically for him but like before and after i never paid attention to swimming it was all gymnastics 
Yeah, women's gymnastics is the most watched sport in the Olympics, believe yeah. it or not, which is, you know, unusual. Women's sports aren't usually the most watched of anything. <laughs> um, but women's gymnastics, it's very exciting to watch, you know, and it's um, up until recently, USA Gymnastics, which is the governing body, had done a pretty good job burnishing the image of gymnasts as shiny, happy little pixies dancing around. Well, you know what flies in the face of that? Abuse. serial sexual abuse, yeah. you know, by employees of USA Gymnastics. Um, and so they covered that up, you know, they hit it with everything they had. And it was just, it, it has been a part of the culture and the sport since the seventies, since I started, you know, and it's not just the sexual abuse, it's the physical and emotional abuse, which I think, you know, the athlete is just browbeaten to the point of, kind of being so beaten down, they don't know up from down and they'll accept any terrible treatment. So anyway, when I first spoke out about this, it was not accepted. It was before me too. You didn't have to believe all women or any women. And the intent of the athletes, as well as the Federation, the US Olympic Committee was to protect the reputation of the sport. Cause to your point, that's what makes the money. Right. Well, it all fell apart eventually when 500 athletes came forward to say this man abused me and you guys knew about it right now and this you were at the time you were uh the head of marketing and the president of levi's is that right yeah i i worked at levi's for 23 years most of my professional life not all of it uh brand i loved since forever have worn and wearing right now um, I started as an entry-level marketing assistant in 1999, and I worked my way up. I was the chief marketing officer for eight years, and I was the brand president, which means overseeing all the product and the marketing and everything uh, for two years towards the end there. And this hubbub that happened over your book in 2008 was not enough. There was not enough of a pushback to make you feel like you were not welcome at work. No, I, I got a ton of support at work, actually. It was only the pushback was within the sports community, within the okay. Olympic movement, because that's where they're invested in protecting the reputation. I did keep it a secret that I had a book coming out at work, but not for the reasons, you know, only because as a woman in corporate America at the time, I didn't want anyone to think that I was distracted or had other aspirations. Like I didn't even have pictures of my kids on my desk, right? Like this was an era when women were like, oh, I'm all, you know, I'm all business. You don't, I, you know, and I, I wanted to move up and, and I did move up and I just didn't want anyone to mistake my kind of aspirations or, you know, I didn't want them to think I was distracted, but it actually at work, um, had a positive effect. You know, I was viewed more as creative. You know, I'd written a book as uh, brave. I had, you know, spoken truth to power. Um, and so it actually kind of accelerated my career internally. Oh, wow. It was cool. externally. Yeah, it was, it was good. It was externally that the, uh, the trolling and the, it was really difficult. And, you know, you have to understand this is my community from this, is what I grew up in. So for these people to turn on you, it was very emotionally difficult. And it was before we all kind of understood social media and how toxic because 2008, that's a long time ago. Yeah, I didn't now I, you know, don't care at all what people call me, but then it was pretty, it was brutal. I didn't know what to make of it, you know, and they were threatening legal action and my publisher was canceling readings because people were threatening to show up and, you know, beat me up and all. And I didn't know that that was probably bullshit. You know, I thought it was real at the time. <laughs> well, no, um, but anybody that says that, that's scary. Like, you know, I don't want to go somewhere that some person has said, I'm going to come and beat you up at this place. That's not a place <laughs> I feel like going. No, I'm very small. I don't want to have threats of being beaten up um, anywhere. But now I think, you know, I, on the flip side of that, though, I do kind of find all of the people saying, oh, I get death threats. I find that all sort of like a little over the top now. I'm like, yeah. you know what? One jerk writing you a mean DM is not a death threat that could be taken seriously. Um, so I think we've got, you know, I just it was a lot then to to take uh, manage and to be ejected, ejected essentially from this community that. You know, I had such a weird childhood. I was training eight, 10 hours a day by the time I was 12 or 13. And these are the only people that really understand you. And yeah. I was not welcome anymore. But it's interesting because the more they resisted and the more they called me a liar, 
the more I knew that there was that I couldn't stop, that these yeah. children needed my protection and that they were hiding probably something worse than I could even imagine, which ended up being true. Yeah, I I kind of tend to use that with my kids. If I say to my if I ask my kids a, a question like, did you do yeah. this thing? And, <laughs> and they freak out. I go like, whoa, so, there's something there. You, you know what That's I mean? Right. Like if I walk in and say, did you kill the dog? And the dog is sitting there happily not dead. The reaction is like, no, what are you talking about? Like, that's crazy. Oh, but yeah. if you start to freak out, I always feel like that. Okay. There's something more to this. If you can't just. It's so um, true. You know. When you get super defensive and they got super defensive. I mean, the head of USA Gymnastics, who was later fired, was calling me at work, telling me I needed to stop. I mean, I was a 40 year old woman at this point. Like this guy was not going to intimidate. I was a 40 year old woman and a vice president at a major corporation. He thought he could intimidate me the way he intimidated the 16 year old gymnast. Yeah. Well, he was not going to going to do that. Um so, yeah, and, and having written that book, ultimately, I wrote about the national team coach in the 80s who I traveled around the world with, who was a serial sexual assaulter. He did not assault me. I stayed away from the man, but several friends, and I wrote about that, and he was eventually banned from the sport. It was past the statute of limitations for him to be um, criminally charged, but he was banned from the sport yeah. for life. So I take great pride in that. Yeah. <laughs> Good. You got somebody yeah. out. You got somebody who needed to be gotten, gotten. Yeah. And, you know, after the Nasser case broke, Larry Nasser is in prison for life. Um, or during that sort of trial and investigation, I met along with many of the Nasser victims with um, senators in D.C. And ultimately, we got what is called the Safe Sport Act passed. Because believe it or not, up until then, Coaches weren't mandatory reporters. So a coach on their staff, they could know was beating or sexually assaulting, and they were not required to report it like a teacher. Wow. Coaches existed sort of outside of the system. Um, now they are. Uh, there's also a system for reporting now. So here's the unfortunate part. So the Safe Sport Act passed in, I think, 2018. They have so many reports they can't keep up. Right. They're, they're years and years behind. I know, for instance, my coaches are, have been now under investigation for four years, but they can't get through the litany of reports. So girls know where to report now. Unfortunately, they're not able to resolve these cases. They're not staffed. It's funded by Congress. They're not funded and staffed the way they need to be. But there is a process in place now. And I think girls learn what is acceptable behavior and what is not from a coach. Yeah. Um, so progress, but slow going. Yeah. Okay. Now, listen, I think I, I would assume that anybody who as a child, um, you, you know, I think there's two sides to this. I think that anybody who can become the national champion in cheerleading has, I'm sorry, in gymnastics, gymnastics but in anything, in any sport Agree. is going gonna, is gonna to have some kind of innate talent. But then it also is, I'm sure, a lot of diligent work. Did that kind of work as a kid mess you up as an adult at all? Because I know like from <laughs> I used to ride bikes like a, like an obsessive person and, and race yeah. them. And yeah. I would hear about professional cyclists who would stop riding bikes and get fat, like almost every one of them. Was there any kind yeah. of issue like that with you? Oh, I had so many issues. I mean, first of all, I think, you know, you're right. It's this kind of bizarre combination of natural talent, but a willingness to just work beyond what people can even imagine. I mean, imagine being 11 years old and training 40 hours a week. Like right. that's insane. Imagine being 13 and begging your parents to let you move away from home to live with a coach. Um, and then the eating disorders are rampant in the sport. You know, we were weighed in twice a day. Our weight was announced over the loudspeaker. We were told you need to lose two pounds by any means necessary by tomorrow. We already had like 2% body fat. I didn't even get my period until I was 20 Oh my God. because of the low body fat. But then when I, when I left for college and I had a sandwich, I gained like 40 pounds because I hadn't eaten for so long. So I was super messed up. I think the way that I was most messed up when I left the sport was just the, I mean, it was post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, we were just, I trained on a broken ankle for two years. 
I hated myself. And I thought I was nothing without these abusive coaches. I had Stockholm syndrome, essentially. And I had to figure out that I was a person of value without gymnastics, without them, that I had a brain, you know, that it gymnastics was not the end of the road for me. And I, I, I was lucky enough to get to go to Stanford and I met all these athletes like Stanford's this unique place where it's an incredible academic school, but it's an incredible sports school also, which is unusual. And I met all these athletes who would go on to become professional baseball players, professional tennis players. And my career was over. And not only was it over, I was completely, you know, unraveled from having participated in it. So I had to figure out what I was going to do. Like, I felt like I was retiring in the old age home and everybody else is so excited and ready to start their life. And I'm like, oh my God, I need a nap. So I had, had a lot of things to sort through, how to get through the eating disorder. I had to get through my rage and anger and resentment at the sport. And I had to get through my very serious imposter syndrome. I just believed I had no worth, you know? What, what, what was the most helpful thing? If there was any one thing in there that you think helped you more than anything else, what was it? I mean, the resilience and the resolve and the discipline I learned in sports, but probably had naturally, I applied to healing myself. Right. And it's interesting at about 25 years old, I was definitely full on feminist. You know, I have no problem still claiming that word, even though I know a lot of women don't like it on the right and the left. To me, it's simple. Women deserve equal opportunity. We deserve the right to vote, own property, (laughs) get a divorce if we want to. I mean, it's not anything crazy. Um, But I realized as this like full on feminist activist that if I was concerning myself all day, with the size of my butt and the number on the scale, that was a waste of my potential. You know, 90% of my thoughts were consumed with this. And I I was like, what are you doing? Most guys aren't doing this. And so would you advocate a friend do this? Like you're reducing your value to how you look. And that's not, that's not what you believe. Right. Jen, I'm talking to myself here. Sure. Um, no, no, I get it. It speaks to me very much too. And so I was like, I'm not doing it anymore. I threw yeah. the scale away. Um, I ate what I wanted. And it's interesting because my weight after I left, I ballooned and then I sort of came down. But until I said, you know what, this doesn't matter. Then I found like, then I found my normal self, you know, right. where my thoughts weren't consumed with food all the time, either to lose weight or to just eat like a, you know, obsessive. Um, I wasn't concerned. I just, I kind of found the set point of what I was supposed to be. The other thing that helped was having children, as you might yeah, imagine. Sure. Um, I had my first child when I was 30, uh, which at the time was really young in San Francisco. <laughs> like all my friends did it much later. Um, doesn't sound young, but um, well, now it does because I'm 55. But I, I, you realize one, my body has this other purpose. So what am I like? This aesthetic stuff is stupid. And two, my life has another purpose. Yeah. And so it really kind of takes the focus off of yourself and I think um, puts it on what matters, you know? So yeah, those it's two the, things. It's the oddest thing. And 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 um and I've talked to all my friends who have kids about this. And 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 like I vacillate between like this is a deeply spiritual experience or this is biology and it's uh some hormone that's triggered in my brain that attaches me to this other human being that I'm incapable of being attached to somebody who I haven't helped create, you know, but like for me too, kids was one of those things where it just aligned my priorities in such a way where it was like, Oh, this bullshit that I'm concentrating on really doesn't matter at all. Yeah. I think that's right. Um, I think that's totally right. Although I, you know, I will say I also care about other things, you know, like, and I think for a lot of women, their children become everything, especially when they have them late in life. And I, you know, I was very much immersed in this, you know, San Francisco mindset and everybody had kids in their forties and they had one. And then this child was like this overmanaged, precious little like glass thing that they, you know, helicoptered to death. So I, you know, I also feel like I care about other things and it's okay 
I'm still a person and it's yeah. okay for me to still pursue these other things. And I don't sure. have to be my child's entertainment all the time. And that's not good for them or for me. So I guess both and, right? Because yeah. I don't know. I'm sure you've observed it. Where do you live? Well, we live all over the place. But uh, okay. uh, we, I, our children were raised in Los Angeles. Right. So I'm sure you've seen it there. These like, just like the hyper helicopter parents and managing every aspect of your child's life. And they don't learn to make decisions or stand on their own or any of that. And so I really try to not, I don't even have to try. Like, I don't want to do that. Um, and I saw that, you know, I had my first kid in 2000 and it's just gotten worse. I, my kids are very far apart. Cause I also have one born in 2016. So there's four of them wow. spread spread apart. And I've seen that, which was starting in the early 2000s, just intensify. And these kids are just not equipped to like do anything on their own. They've just been managed like veal in a pen, <laughs> you yeah. know, for so long. And so I don't want to raise those kinds of children. I want to raise children who are resilient and who can pick themselves up when they fail yeah. because failure is inevitable. And, um, can make good decisions in the moment for themselves because maybe they've met a bad one before and they yeah. dealt with the repercussions of that. Um, so the point being kids did re realign my priorities. And I also do, I continue to care about my professional life and my work and I take great pride and joy in work. I love work, meaning yeah. like not work like my job, but I love working and making things and making progress and working with people. I love all that. So that still matters to me. Well, I, I first heard your name uh, during the it, at the towards the early part of the pandemic. You know, I have I have four girls from oh, wow. they're now. I don't remember exactly what their ages were at the time. Now they're the oldest is 28. The youngest is 17. And oh, wow. I, got, I have a granddaughter and a grandson now. And like oh, I could not be the most pleased with my life. But I remember. Two of them went to college on were in college on the East Coast at the yeah. time. One of them was in a boarding school in the Pacific Northwest. So they all come home. And in the beginning, I was like, you know, I don't know what this is. We don't know what this is. I've got a, a freezer full of meat and a couple hundred pounds of rice. And my wife told me in February to buy toilet paper. So we're not even a part of the toilet paper rush. You know what I mean? Like I sat down with her You're and like, said, we're good. I said to yeah. her, I, I've got water, meat, rice, canned vegetables. What do you want or need if we can't leave the house for a while? And she said toilet paper. And I was like, toilet paper? What do you mean? <laughs> like, I never would have thought of that. Okay, I'll go buy some toilet paper. So I stocked yeah. up on that. And then it was the first thing to go. And I was like, you're a genius. You're you're so prescient about this toilet paper thing. I would have just <laughs> taken a shower a couple of times a day. You know what I mean? Like, that would have been my solution. Um, That's a good solution. Yeah. Right? I, I don't know. It wouldn't have crossed my mind. But very early on, I think um, it was like, Three weeks in, my wife and one of our daughters, and we lived in Los Angeles right near this big public park called Griffith Park, which is like yeah. hiking trails. It's yep. it's not a park in New York City that gets crowded. You know, maybe right. a birthday party in some area might get crowded, but right. like you can go, I can do a two-hour hike through Griffith Park not and not pass it. a person. Yeah. Yeah. And they were walking, they walked from our house to Griffith Park, and somebody in a car started yelling at them about social distancing and masking and they were outside and they, and my wife was like, we live together. Like, and we're, and we're outside. We're going to, we're nowhere near other people. And this guy was enraged with her. And right away I became somewhat disillusioned with uh, society's reaction to this thing. You know, my wife had, um, so some of her family owned medical buildings and, and the doctors in these buildings were saying there's going to be triage in every public place next Tuesday. And next Tuesday never came every week. She'd be told this. And then finally we were like, this thing that we're being told is happening is not happening the way they're saying it's going to happen. This is an overreaction. So when I saw, I don't know if it was Twitter or it was a news story. And I saw you speaking out and going like, why are we punishing our children? It was, it like sang to me, you know, because really for me and my wife, 
we had a nice time. All our kids came home and that was nice. But then they were also the ones suffering. Like it wasn't hard for her and I, it was really yeah. hard for them. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I lived in San Francisco at the time. I, I don't anymore. I left during the pandemic so that my youngest children could go to school. I had kids, one in college, a public university in California, one in high school, a public school, one starting elementary and one in preschool. So I like saw all the ages, but I, you know, I was a long time, um, San Francisco public school parent. I, you know, my kid was a junior about to be a senior. I knew the student population. I knew that 60% weren't free or reduced lunch. Like these are low income children. I was the only person of my kind of class, which makes me a class trader, um, that sent her kids to public school, you know, and all those people in San Francisco from the, from the, so I didn't even have a moment, my husband and I, where we were like, okay, this seems reasonable. We were from the beginning, like, this is not reasonable. This is never going to end. Right. There is no off ramp. You know, they closed the schools March 13th, uh, 2020. We were like, hell no. And there was already plenty of data that showed that the median age of death was over 80. Like this yes. was not harmful to children. We knew it from the beginning. Don't let anyone tell you ever we didn't know and we did the best we could. It's total bullshit. We did know and we did the worst that we possibly could. And poor, vulnerable children were harmed the most. Children bore the brunt of this. Um, and whether they were, you know, middle or upper income, they still suffered from isolation and all of it. Um, but we just put the burden on children. It's, it's horrible what we did to children. And I think, you know, people ask me all the time, why did you do it? Because I was very outspoken from the beginning. And as you can imagine, that was not very popular in San Francisco. I mean, I had people chasing me down the street, screaming at me that I was a murderer and no one would be sad for me when all my children died. It's, um, it's madness. It's psychotic. Madness. These people, everybody lost their fucking minds. And you know what makes me crazy? So, and some of us were out there from the beginning, very few of us, but some of us were out there from the beginning and we were taking a lot of heat. I have lost almost every single friend I ever had for the last 30 years. Almost a few have stood by me. Um, I ultimately had to, you know, leave the city that I loved and lived in for 33 years because I was literally being harassed and chased out. People were publishing my address online. Um, people were calling, you know, the ethics hotline at my work to say that I was a murderer. I mean, I had to leave. Because to you leave. said this was not health. This was not the healthy reaction for children. Yes. And I kept it to children, even though I was opposed to all of it, because I thought children were like this gateway drug that we could all agree the bridge. Right. We could all agree we don't want to hurt children. Meanwhile, um, in the fall of 2020, all the private schools start opening and, all. you know, it's just like it was so structurally classist and let's racist, even though I was the one being called a racist, the racist policy was keeping black children out of school while rich white children went to school, which is exactly what happened in every major city in America. So, you know, I was harassed and hounded and um, I didn't stop. You know, I was I I I it was a difficult time. You know, it was a very difficult time. I. But I. I wish someone had stood up for me when I was a child and abuse and mistreatment was happening. That's what kept going through my head. Who is going to stand up for these children? I don't know what will happen to me. I think I'll, uh, I think I'll be okay. I think people will come around not just because of me, but other people more prominent than me. And they'll, they'll, they'll shake sense, common sense into people that did not happen <laughs> that I, I don't suddenly all of a sudden, you know, I was watching uh, Bill Maher over the weekend and somebody made a comment about how obviously school closures were bad and the whole audience cheered as if they'd always known it. And it made me so angry because I was like, what the fuck were you before? Right. Don't pretend you always knew. Um, but ultimately I left my city. I left my job of 23 years um, and my life is pretty unrecognizable all because I said poor kids should get to go to school during COVID. That that's my crime. I mean, and then yeah. I, let me just tell it's you this part. Baffling it's, because it's such an easy argument from the left. And I think it's the left that got the most mad at you. Oh, I think only, I think the left only cancels its own. I don't right. think they bother trying to go after people on the right because they're like, well, we know they're bad. Like, we don't like Ben Shapiro. <laughs> we don't like Candace Owens. We can't cancel them. But I mean, I was a lifelong lefty. You know, I had been a loyal Democrat for since I could vote. I used I worked for now as a national organization for women as an intern when I was in college. Um, 
but I was so astonished. It felt the whole thing felt like such a trespass of the left stated values that we care about the vulnerable and the poor and we care about children. We care about free speech. Let's like talk about that for a second, the censorship and the, you know, all of it. Um, and it, it was all a lie. Everything just felt like a lie. And then, of course, once you see that, you're like, well, what else are they lying about? And then I start to sound like a crazy conspiracy theorist, but all of it turned out to be true. Um, but I just don't trust the party anymore at all. I think they're liars and fakers and hypocrites. And they're just power-seeking narcissists. And they I, don't I, care I, at all. I, I was talking it. to somebody recently about this. I don't think it even requires conspiracy. I just think it's no. almost <laughs> human nature. Like, yeah. if, if there's a... If there's a, a power vacuum that appears yeah. people will try to cling to it and fill it with their power you, you know what i mean i don't think it requires like three old guys in a room getting no, together i completely agree with you i don't really believe in the you know three mustache guys in a room planning and moving all the pieces i definitely believe more in the kind of mass formation psychosis that everybody kind of moves in one direction which is what happened during covid um so yeah, I agree with you. I, when I say I sound like a conspiracy theorist, like yeah, you know, when you take things like the lab leak, which everybody was saying was a conspiracy theorist a theory, right? That this escaped a lab from a lab in Wuhan. Well, like no, it's the most obvious, <laughs> obvious thing. The one lab in the world that studies coronaviruses and the first appearance of it is there within right. miles. Like, um. Yeah, there's nothing exactly. Anyway, I became completely disillusioned with yeah. the left. I don't I I don't know that I can ever forgive them. And the way this is the most disgusting part is the way they kind of marshal their team to come for people. Right. Like why couldn't we have a conversation about this? Why couldn't we there were reasonable people, people on the left who, but no, they have to do a takedown. They have to do a takedown of pe doctors who expressed another view and call them fringe epidemiologists. Doctors like, you know, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, who I think will Weren't be the next head of the NIH. To, and they were threatening to take their licenses away, right? Yes, Some of them. all of it. Yeah. Their tenure, their licenses, they were saying perfectly reasonable things. You know, the pandemic policy they were espousing was exactly the policy pre-COVID that was like on paper from the CDC. They weren't saying crazy shit but the way that they come for you and like i said marshal the loyal culty members of the party to do it and to cancel you and to take you down as a warning to no one to, to others not to trespass not to criticize that's what it is it's a warning it's disgusting yeah it's it's truly disgusting i can never I, I I don't imagine unless there is like a full throated. We were wrong. These are the things we did. Um, we harmed children. We came after people who challenged. We censored the people. Like I can never vote for a Democrat. Again. Yeah, I I'm I I was raised in Los Angeles. Most of my friends are Democrats, and yeah. this uh, provided so much fuel for argument and amongst my friends i will say none of them lost their minds to the point where i couldn't say exactly what i was thinking i could say to every one of my close friends exactly there did come a point where i had to give them this analogy like me pointing out problems within this party does not mean that i'm gung-ho for the other party that would be like saying wow. if i said guantanamo was bad and you called yeah. me a terrorist supporter these two right. things are not mutually exclusive. So we did have to get by that a little bit, but then I was able to go like, okay, good. Now look, there's a lot of problems here. Um, I assume the you're lucky though. You're lucky. I, I agree. No, I agree. And I'm still very close with them today. And I don't hold back. Like on our group chat, I could probably be canceled 30 times over for some of the stuff I'm saying. And I'm saying it to lifelong Democrats, you know? Yeah. Um, but I, but I, I got to assume this kind of stuff happens on the right. I am just so from a place that right. was I, always left that I don't know about it. I don't pay attention. I don't, yeah, I don't know either. And I, I guess my feeling is because, you know, one of the criticisms I get is I'm so critical of the left publicly and I'm not very critical of the right. And I consider myself an independent, um, but I did vote almost straight up and down 
right in this last election with a few exceptions in, in Colorado, which I'd never done in my life before, but I, I still am a registered independent. Um, now I totally lost my train of thought. Oh, uh, the entire media, mainstream media is dedicated to criticizing the right. Right. Like, I don't, we don't need, need to, do to. That. I don't need. Yeah. That's what I said to them. And they were, and they would say like, what about Fox? And I'd like, who fucking watches Fox? None of us have ever watched Fox. What do we know from Fox? We don't need to criticize. Also, they have Fox. That's it. It's one channel. It is actually the most watched news channel, but of the mainstream media, which is dying anyway, but they have CNN, they have the New York times, they have MSNBC, they have, um, ABC, every, CBS, the Washington NBC, Post, ABC, yeah, CBS, all of it. Every major newspaper, the LA Times, the, the Chicago Tribune, the Philadelphia, like every, like they have all of it, all of it. Yeah. NPR. Did we forget NPR, which is the most annoying <laughs> right. news outlet you can possibly listen to? So yeah, the right has Fox. Was right. there was there a moment when you because for me, like the majority of my twenties and thirties, and even early forties. Like this American life was my abs. This American life and radio lab were my absolute favorite shows. And I cannot listen to them anymore. It's like a nails on a chalkboard, isn't it? Well, me too. I, and, and I don't perceive that there has been a change in me. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like my I, principles I don't have remained the I, same. I agree. I care about free speech. I care about kids. I care about women's rights. Everything I do is is actually and I anti-war. I'm anti-war, which is now apparently a right wing thing to be anti-war. That's <laughs> right wing. Um uh when did it start to change? That's a really good question. I mean, it was like a hard start in March uh, you know, of 2020, but I think before that I started to question some things and see yeah. see some things that were disturbing. Um, I'm Jewish. I started to see some real anti-Semitism from the left. If you remember sometime around 2018, when the left and the feminists were doing their, um, you know, Putsi had the marches, the women's marches, there sure. were a bunch of Jewish women contingents that were kicked out of the marches. Really? Yes. I didn't know. And that. I was like, that's disturbing in Chicago. Yeah. They kicked out. There was, they weren't from they kicked out the Jews, basically. They said, you can't march here because of intersectionality and war for Palestine. So that was disturbing to me. Um, sometime around 2018, I think it was, I had to start all the anti-racism training at work. And I had to um, one time do it with Robin D'Angelo, the one, the main, you know who she is. 1619 um, Project, yeah. No, no, no. Robin D'Angelo is... Um, is that not her? The white, no, that's Hannah Nicole Jones. Nicole Jones, right. Yeah. Um, no, uh, Robin D'Angelo is a white lady who does the anti-racism training, and she okay. wrote White Fragility. She Got wrote it. the book. Okay. Um, so I had to do training with her in 2018, and I was like, okay, this is this is not good. <laughs> like, basically, there's no answer that isn't I'm a racist. If I, I either have to, but what she wants me to do is not cry with my white lady tears, but get on one knee and, you know, disavow my racism and just apologize for it for the rest of my life. I'm not doing that. Um, I can't sort of try to defend myself and say, well, I have black children and I like, that's worse. Cause then you're, <laughs> then you're even a bigger racist. So I was like, I guess I just have to sit here and be silent. And I was like, this is a trap. Yeah. I, this is not good. This is not going to improve the way we work together. This is going to increase tension at work. I didn't know what to do about it. And what was upsetting to me is I'm all in. Racism does exist. Like I'm not here sitting here saying there's no such thing as racism. What I'm saying is this is not the solution. Right. And then during COVID, what was upsetting to me is we then we had to do a lot of anti-racism training because it was after the BLM riots and everything in 2020 and George Floyd's death. And I was so, I was like, why are we sitting here doing this? this training, if we want to help black people, young people, we need to get the schools, like we need concrete action. These are the children who are not in school and they're being harmed. They're already, you know, struggling in the education system. And now we just shut them out of school. Like I want action. I don't want a bunch of white people sitting around and disavowing their privilege. That actually doesn't help anyone. Right. So the whole thing just felt like a big you know, hypocritic. It just felt so 
it was all virtue. I hate the term virtue signaling, but that's what it was. You know, it didn't do anything. It didn't yeah. do anything. And so I just was like, I'm done. I can't be with these people anymore. <laughs> these are not my people. And how do you go from Levi's to XXXY? What is that progression? Well, I, I left my job in February of 22. I took a little break because it had been a difficult two years. And then I started to interview, you know, for big jobs because I've been in retail my whole professional life. I had won all these awards. I had to help Levi's go public. And as I was interviewing, it would be fine in the beginning. It, you know, I'd go through the first few rounds and they'd ask me about my skills and case studies and all this. And then sometimes six, seven interviews in, which is what you have to do if you're interviewing for a CEO, someone from HR would ask me if I was willing to apologize for what I'd done. About COVID, about saying yes. saying yes. kids' schools shouldn't, but what you've done. Wow, in 2023, you... they asked me this question and I was wow. like, excuse, excuse me? <laughs> What'd you say? Will you apologize? No. I was right about everything. No, I will not apologize. I mean, the hubris, it's like, I didn't apologize for the two years it was happening when I was risking everything. Why would I apologize now? Are you, yeah. you know? Now, in- when when I think, and I, and I don't have anything to back this up, I just think that um, what has permeated the ether is that you were right. I, Am do I think wrong? it's permeated? Do you th- I there aren't a lot of people that I meet that go like, yeah, shutting down schools was a great idea. I, I don't know. Kids, people I, with kids, I people think, not with kids. I think you're right. But here's the thing. In corporate America, what is valued is following the script, especially at a senior level. Right. You have to follow the script that legal gives you, that Corpcom gives you. And I had proven myself unrepentant and unwilling to do that. You are persona non grata at that point. It doesn't matter if you were right. They do a lot of lip service for pretending they want brave, courageous leaders. No, they don't. They want people who will read the script that is given to them. Right. And I had proven myself not to be that person. So that gets you ousted from corporate America. But here's what I will say. I don't disagree with you, but why then? Because I would say I lost 95% of the people that I had been friends with since college. They still don't talk to me. Why? So. Well, yeah, I I mean, I think it unfortunately comes down to a bigger thing that you are standing up against and saying like this whole narrative that we're all meant to live by. I'm challenging it, you know, and that really was what it felt like. It was like, you know, unfortunately, it was like the empire strikes back and nobody can tell who's the rebels and who's the, you know, the empire, you know what I mean? And I'm going like, no, the people who are saying this is not right are the rebels. And, right. you know, right. at, you watch star Wars. It's pretty easy, which team you want to be on, but right. like, then it comes to real life and it's like, you know, they felt like right. they were saving lives by participating in this. And some people still believe it. And some people are just sort of um, okay. politics and being a member of the Democratic Party and being a member of the left has replaced religion, I think, in a lot of people's lives. I'm not a religious person, but I don't like being told what to do either by my faith or a party. And so I'm going to think and decide for myself. Some people would tell me, my religious friends, that that is not me. That's God telling me, but um, that's fine. Um, they're they're just, I mean, they're, they're, I, I don't know. I have now violated every principle that they hold dear. I think the many on the left are the most conformist, non-rebellious, non-troublemaking, although they think of themselves as the resistance. Now they get to be the resistance because now they're in the minority. So they should be very happy with that. But um, you know, I, I violated all the rules and then I kept going. So yeah. maybe they would have forgiven me for COVID, but then to answer your question about the brand, I, uh, when I realized I would not be able to go back into corporate America and get a job, I decided I'd have to start my own thing. So I decided to start this brand XXXY athletics, which combines my background as an athlete, my fashion experience and my willingness to say, true but inconvenient things because i looked at all the athletic brands who pretend to stand up for women and they aren't you know and they're saying boys come on into women's sports what's the difference ever if you say you're a girl you're a girl and i 
you know, this, this idea of boys can be girls and boys are girls. If they say they're girls, this is now a kind of religious, um, (laughs) belief on the left. There's no proof. They have faith and they believe it. And if you violate that, you are a really horrible person. And of course, my friends mostly lived in places like Los Angeles and Seattle and San Francisco, and they all have a child that is non-binary or having has transitioned. And so me having a viewpoint on this issue, just put a hammer and a nail in my coffin. Um, yeah, there's no sacred cows anymore for me. I'll just say what I think. Okay. Let me ask you, let's really talk about this because I get, I go down rabbit holes and one of them is, well, I have a question and you would know this and I just don't know this. Has there been an instance where a trans boy has competed in men's sports and done well? Has that happened? No. No. Right. Okay. So that answers In fact, that. in fact, in most instances, a trans man, a trans boy or a trans man, which is a woman biologically to not kind of create too confusing of language. They usually choose to compete in the women's category. Right. And as long as they're not taking testosterone, they can. So there was a non-binary runner. I don't believe non-binary is a thing, um, but there was a non-binary runner in the Olympic Olympics who I think won a medal, Nikki Hiltzik. And it was championed as this like you know, this hero, see trans people can compete. It's, you know, all these big, it's like, no one cares. She's a woman. She says she's, she's a woman. Fine. Run with the women. No one's complaining about that. So there was actually a boxer um, who said she was a man, a trans man, but she competed in women's too. So generally the females are choosing to compete in the women's category. The non-binaries are competing in the women's category and the trans women are competing in the women's category. So basically everybody wants to compete in women's. (laughs) Right. Okay. So that leads me to my other, my next thought. And this is, um, two things. Like when I was a kid, I was a part of subculture and, And I do also believe that like cultural values change and evolve over time. And like any need to affix them here and now is not going to work. They are going to continue Mm. to evolve. Like we go back to ancient Greece and those people behaved in a much different way that would be appalling to us today in certain aspects, right? Especially with regard to like behavior towards children. Ancient Rome was like, had just like a massive uh, instance of infanticide. Like you could go into basically any backyard and dig a hole and find kids. Um, So like that is gross, but it wasn't gross to them then. That was just how they lived. And now today we find ourselves here. Obviously in the last 50 years, culture has evolved, but it's slow. It happens slowly and it's gradual. I do think there is something to some idea coming about getting uh, uh, fuel behind it and then everybody going, this is today we're making the change and this is how it is. I think it there can be a thing where it's like that hasn't – we haven't had enough time to sit with that yet and now you're just telling us this is right. So that's one way I look at it. And then the other thing I look at is like – when I was a kid and I was punk rock, I had whatever my identity was, which was like uh, basically a fuck you to the norm. That was me too. <laughs> but there was after gymnastics, yeah. Right. There was no part of me that had to be witnessed or accepted or approved. It was just it. me. It was. I this love. Was like, I I want no part in your structure. I'm going to do my own thing. And if you don't like how I look, go fuck yourself. Right. And we made no demands on anyone else. That's what's so crazy about this is the demand is I am this. You must normalize it. You must call me what I want you to call me. You must allow me to validate myself as a woman by competing in women's sports. Even though I went through male puberty, I'm obviously a man and I have a penis. Like it's this constant like validation and everything has to be normalized. I mean, you know, during COVID in San Francisco, the open air drug use became like crazy. And they were running all these billboards saying, don't be ashamed of your IV drug use, use with friends, use in public, don't do it alone. It's like, no, be ashamed. (laughs) Like I don't really, or the drag queen story hours. It's like, 
I've been to a million drag shows in my life. The whole point is that it's, you know, dissident or it was like, why? Everything has to be normal. And in the, like, we didn't want that. We wanted to be fuck you to normal. And yeah. now it's like all the like, you know, craziest behavior has to be mainstreamed and normalized, which I think that's why I say they're all conformists now. Yeah. The left is all like aggressively conformist. Well, yeah. And when I was a, in the nineties, I would, I was a drug addict and I was not, and I was, uh, I had, I had my own set of problems, but when I would go to New York, I would go to a tranny bar in the lower East side right. called stingy Lulu's. And it was my favorite place to go. Yeah. And it was subversive. Though. It was subversive. And the people who were there who would break out into song while they served you dinner um, were subversive. And now the idea of like turning that down or <laughs> making that puritanical and serve to children. First of all, I don't believe for a second that what the show I was getting at Stingy Lulu's in 1994 is what they're serving to preschool kids. It just would be, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't believe it if I just don't think that's possible because these, these gals were hardcore and like grinding yeah. on you and it, and it was meant to be subversive, but why does that, why can't that exist in that way? And why do we have to take that and, and make it milk toast enough to serve the children? Why can't it just be that? I agree. Yeah. I, I don't know. There's this like trend that every it I blame partly the sort of like psych community. It's like everything has to be de-shamed. Why? First of all, there are some behaviors that are shame worthy. And you probably feel I don't know how you feel or how you got through your drug addiction. My husband was also um, had a very serious um, addiction problem. Shame brought sure. him out of it. Yeah. He hit bottom with the shame. That was not the person he wanted to be. You should be that that can pull you out of the lowest <laughs> point in your life and the worst behavior and failing to live up to what you can be. So, but you know, within the you know, the the the, the medical community, the psych community, everything is de-shamed. And part of well, de shaming is bringing out in the sunlight. And it's like, you know what? There's also some behavior, sorry, that no, go ahead. you don't need to be ashamed of, but they're adult. Yeah. You have uh, weird you, you, sex with whoever you want. Yeah, <laughs> no. You don't need to know about it. Right. The the thing that you're touching upon is another thing that I empathize yeah. truly and deeply with, you, you know, in my own way with transsexuals, which is I was overweight my whole life and utterly felt that I was in the wrong body. Utterly. My body was never right. I was deeply shamed by my body. The thing is, nobody, no, I got, I dieted down and lifted weights for 15 years and got a six pack. And I still felt everything that I felt from my childhood. No amount of somebody telling me you're worthy, you're beautiful, you're okay, you, you're not a piece of shit. That doesn't solve the problem within me. The problem with me is only solved by me. That's and right. so- I, you know, I understand, like, I want to tell overweight people, like, step one is love yourself. You have to be doing this for yourself. You have to care for yourself. But step one is not everybody has to reinforce that idea because you right. still don't believe it. Right. And step one is also not healthy at any size. Yeah, it's not cool. right. That's a it's great not lying. It's, right. Loving yourself is a great step towards like, now I'm going to improve my you condition. You do better. Yes. I am a person. Look, I got, after I left gymnastics and been anorexic, I got, have been, you know, pretty heavy and I hated myself for that. And at the end of the day, that you're totally right. Like I had to, I, I had to come to realize I was a person with value because of how I think and how I treat other people, not because of how I look. And only when I accepted that value in myself, did I get to a normal way of eating and exercising and just like being a normal person that was healthy. Um, and I did everything to rebel after gymnastics. You know, I drank too much. I did all the things I just, you know, I did, but I had to come to accept that my value was as a human. Nobody should feel that they don't have value as a human. Right. But the body positivity movement has jumped the shark. And we are, I mean, 93% of Americans, are, adults are 
either overweight or obese. Yeah. I mean, this is a death march. We are not doing them any favors by saying you can be healthy at any size. It's a lie. It's not well, true. Well, it is also, it's also, I think, uh, trying to create, you know, if I, if I give the healthy at every size people the benefit of the doubt, I think that step one is a rational thing is I'm worth it enough yeah, to fight I for agree. this thing. But it's not making everybody else reinforce that value That's because right. it's untrue. You know, it's coercion. It's it's just the weirdest thing. Well, all of it, the pronouns, you must recite your pronouns. That's coercion. I mean, for that started in around 2018 at work, too. That was another I didn't mention that. But that was another one that I was like, why would I? I'm not doing that. Like I've had four children here. You've literally seen me pregnant four times. Like yeah. I've never presented as anything other than female, a fat female, a skinny female, but <laughs> undeniably female. Like I'm just not doing, I didn't even know why I didn't want to do it. I just didn't want to, like, it felt like core speech to me, which it is. Yeah. You know? Uh, all right. My, my last question is as we, he, he, I, this is just something I was reading about recently was that I believe Harvard, you know, um, surrogacy is on the rise and this is for professional women who can't uh, gestate their own children yeah, uh, or whoever, who you know, yeah. for whatever these gay guys, are, yeah, gay know. couple. Yeah. Harvard, I believe is working on and has recently made breakthroughs on uh, oh, no. a womb. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? The womb. I mean, I, I, did, I figured where you were going. Yeah. yeah. So it's like an what, artificial, womb. an artificial womb. So you could implant a sperm into an egg and then put it in this, I guess, machine and it would bring the baby to term. And then you have a baby. If that is the direction we're going, what does it mean to have a differentiation between sexes going into the future? If, if, 150 years from now, that's how we're making kids. Wow, you're just catching me off guard. I don't know. I feel like everything, I that grosses me out. I think it's bad and wrong. And I think we're humans playing God here. And I think that is the same in terms of changing genders and all that. Like, we're what are we doing? We are yeah. not Mr. Potato Heads that you like cut parts off and put fake ones back on. And hey, it's the same. I, I feel like, and this is where people get to this, you're erasing women. Like all of this revolves around not recognizing what is unique and amazing about women. Look, I don't, as a woman, want to be reduced to my ability to have children, but I also want to be respected for it. And women are the ones being called cervix havers, uterus. No one's calling men penis havers. They're calling them men. Like all of this energy. Well, no, is, but it gets it, worse than that because now I've heard that penises can be feminine also. I read that's, that. That's recently. right. Women can have penises. Right. But right. that's what I mean. They're fucking with what it is to be a woman. And so you're going to take away our unique, amazing thing that we bear children and let anyone do it or do it outside in some plastic box, which cannot be the same. I'm sorry. It's just not the same. It's never going to be the same for a child. Or you're going to put a womb in a man. You're going to do a womb transplant. I don't know how he's going to, I guess they'll cut it out of him. I, I, it's just like, I feel like, they are taking, they, I know people hate using that, but the like medical industrial complex is taking away everything that is special and amazing about being a woman. And I find it really, and in fact, they're saying there is nothing unique about being a woman. Anyone can be a woman. You tomorrow, Ethan, can stand up with full penis and everything and say, I am a woman and let me box in the Olympics and beat the shit out of another woman. I Anyone my... can be a woman. My wife and my four daughters and my granddaughter <laughs> would have something to say about that. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. So I don't like that idea, whatever yeah. it is. I yeah, like it. it's, a, it's a bizarre idea, but I was, I was reading this and, you know, um, yeah. this, this urge towards collapsing everything into being the same and all homogenized. And I'm and not make, into it. I like different stuff. I like, yeah. you know, They're going make to the religious. Yeah. Yeah. I like going to the part of town that is different from the part of town yes. I live in. And I want to go and know that there's like lots of places I can go that are different. If diversity is our strength, let's be as yes. diverse as possible. You know what I mean? 
Um, I feel like there's, said, a, I yeah. think there are still things where like, it doesn't make sense for, to me, if, if we can just categorize things, if we're, if we're going to get into like the gender debate, um, and gender can just be how you present, then why not just make sports biologically based? And then there's no question, you know, women's sports should be for X, X only. I think we should stop using the term gender. I understand I was, you know, very into feminist studies in college. Like I understand why we use it. It's about these sort of roles that are set for us, you know, but here there's two sexes. There are two sexes and there's infinite personalities. And as feminists in the 70s and 80s and the 90s, what we were fighting for was the right for women to, or at least one of the things, be able to express what that means. I could be a more masculine presenting woman. I'm still a woman. I could be a lesbian. I'm still a woman. Um, and we're throwing that all out the window. I mean, that's one of the things about this debate that I find enraging is it's incredibly retrograde. If you are a, you know, a male child who has feminine characteristics as a boy, you might be told that you're a girl. Why? Why can't you be a boy that plays with dolls? Why right. can't you be a boy that might grow up to be gay? It feels anti-woman. Um, it feels yeah. Yeah. retrograde. It feels anti-gay to me. Um, so I find the whole thing very alarming. But the, you know, the last thing I'll say, I think I have to hop off and do another yeah. show in a second, is... Um, the faithful, the religious, and like I said, I'm I'm not a religious person, but I would call myself a secular humanist. And I think we all have to join forces, the religious and the secular humanist, because we, I think, respect for, I don't have a better word for it, but the human soul, that we are all these u- unique beings. And you can't just, we're not made of clay and plastic, and you can't just take off the parts and put them back together. That We respect our humanity, and it feels to me like the left does not it's like very dr frankenstein at this point that's where i am i love it secular (laughs) humanist i really really like that jennifer thank you so much thank you for having me it's great to meet you i've been a fan for a long time and i'm a fan of yours thank you thank you